My name is Tomoko, and it's a great honor to be here today. And especially this year, that Japan is one of the guest countries, I heard. So I'm very, very、um, honored to be here today. And then meeting all of you here in this,、uh, on this floor. So again, it's a great pleasure to be here. I would like to be sharing my passion in history today. So I'd like to be telling a story, and a story focusing on two themes. Diplomacy and the lady samurai. So that's relevant for you. For example, the diplomacy, yes, of course. And then some of the people are looking at me. What do you mean by the lady samurai? And that's exactly what we are going to be talking about today. First of all, so when do we have to go to meet the lady samurai? So I will take you to the end of the 16th century. So the end of the 16th century, that means. Right before, maybe that year, 1600. So, we, go, we are going to be going to Japan at the end of the 16th century, for example, the time like eight,、uh, 1588. So, now we're going to have a setup, right? right? So, we are all going into the 16th century Japan, 1588, as a focal point. Okay? 1588. I don't know what happened here in Dubai, and then I don't know what happened to Japan at that time. So, first of all, just a brief introduction of what was happening there in Japan would be relevant. So, I will share a very, very short, short、uh, slideshow of the samurai who lived at that time. Who did you see, right? Are there a samurai as you expected? More or less. For example, that person over there is on horseback. This person over here has a matchlock. This person over here, the samurai, with a spear. That person over there with a sword. So, those are the typical i m a g e of the male samurai of that time. So, at the end of the 16th century, What you would expect is a conflict. Samurai were fighting against each other. But why did they have to fight, really? So, there was a, it relates to the time where they lived. So, samurai did not really fight all the time from the time that they were born. But at that time, 1588, there were still many small domains in Japan because there are no government. So, without a central government, the domain split around Japan, and then samurai were guarding each other, fighting each other, and protecting their domain. So, that was the situation at the end of the 16th century. The key here is that there were no government yet. So, when I bring up the women side of the story into it, it will be more complicated. So, we just saw some figures like the samurai. But when I say, how about the lady samurai, you'll be more puzzled. Because many of you, I'm guessing, that you never heard of the word the lady samurai. Or if I just say the lady samurai, you will think that maybe that's the female version of the samurai. That means female has sword skills, 
the female has a spear, and it, they could go to the battlefield? Actually, no. That was not the lady samurai that I'm talking about. So first of all, lady samurai were not the fighters. We, who we're going to meet today were not the fighters, and that's a very important point. Another point that I have to clarify is that the lady samurai were not also those figures you might be familiar with. For example, this was written by the 19th century impressionist painter, and then his name, Monet. So for example, like this painting, kimono was really, really popular in the West and in other countries. So when I say the lady samurai, people will think that the female who wore the kimono would be classified to be called the lady samurai. Another example, the same sort of things, the 19th century impressionist. And again, the woman in the kimono represented beautifully about their identities. But here again, I am not going to be talking about the woman just to be in a beautiful kimono. There will be a little more than that. So the lady samurai story that we are going to be talking about today, again, they are not fighters. They are not just pretty in a kimono. Okay. Let's meet the first person that I call the lady samurai. Her name is Higashi. Higashi came from a domain upper in the north. So that area has a domain, like a huge domain, and then there was a household that was ruling, uh, ruling the entire domain. So again, no government, no central government, but then there was this house ruling the entire domain. This house that Higashi was born had a rival. Rival house always had a fight with the rulers, trying to get the solo leadership of this domain. So again, this century, the samurai won't fight all the time. So Higashi's marriage was arranged to merge those two houses. So if Higashi goes to marry this house, then this house is technically one. So it could avoid the conflicts. So the marriage was arranged for Higashi. And then that actually worked for some years. So around the time in 1588, like by the time, around that time, like 1580, there are no conflicts thanks to her marriage. Domain was peaceful, everything was okay. But when Higashi's husband passed away, things have changed. So unfortunately, no more ruler of this domain, so that Higashi's brother, Higashi's son, they started to lead two armies and then they, they, they were about to clash that they wanted to get the solo rulership of this domain. So for Higashi, that's really bad news because if this battle happens, Higashi will lose either her son or her brother. You don't want to lose you know, brother or son. So she should do something about it. So there, what do you think she, she, she's done? she didn't fight. Because as a female figure, that she knew that maybe she doesn't have a good possibility uh, to win over the battles with men. She didn't fight. So she chose a different approach. What could it be? 1888. So at that time, what she decided to do is that instead of fighting, she gave up on weapons went into the battlefield in this carriage. So this is a carriage that you can see. The woman can be going in and then like, you know, carried by someone. So this is a very privileged uh, vehicle for the woman to be using. So on the battlefield, when her brother and then her son was about to fight, she decided to get in the middle of this battle. And then she made this carriage as a fortress so that no one can actually clash into two. So in this situation, she can't be just there. She decided to send out letters to both sides. She sent letters to her brother. She sent letters to her sons, so that hopefully the two sides will come up with a condition for truth. So here's a question for you. So she wrote letters 
but then how long did the negotiation last? Can you guess? Maybe a day? Two days? One week? A month? 40 days. Actually, she stayed there in the middle for about 70 to 80 days. Negotiation took time. So Higashi was very, very patient and then trying to persuade both sides by the words that she writes. For example, she wrote something like this. I see an undesirable battle has happened here. I heard that you're not happy, but please be satisfied with the following condition. So she continued, continued, continued. So it's a great skill to have. And also just to note that the letters were the standard and also formal tools for the, the high uh, elite class people to be using so that she was literally to know and like how to write, how to uh, send letters, how to send words in the proper format. So the power of pen actually helped her and then two sides did not fight at the end. They came up with a term of truth. Higashi's strategy of not fighting but relying on words actually worked. So that was the first person that we met now that we could call the Lady Samurai. She wrote and then she negotiated. Let's move on. Maybe you might want to meet another person just to make sure that the Lady Samurai did something good for us. Her name is Nei. This person, this woman, were not from a privileged house. She was born in a low status class. So she was like, she was not a princess and she was not in the high class of one of the domains. And um, she was not really like belonging to any high class um, elite household of the samurai. But then what was happening at the time of her marriage is that she was married to a foot soldier who was who initiated the unification of Japan. So what was happening there is that the time of Nei, around the same time of uh, 1580s, what happened was that those 250 domains were going into, um, governed by one government. So there are some people called unifiers, they started, you know, initiated an action that there should be one government to be ruling this entire nation. So Nei was at that time married to a foot soldier, but then this foot soldier was uh, serving for the first unifier of Japan. So the first unifier of Japan who started this whole unification process um, was succeeded by Nei's husband, and then another person succeeded him. So with those people succeeding this project, the entire project of uniting 250 domains into one, Japan was becoming a nation. So Nei's husband, this, uh, this person, used to be a foot soldier, but then by winning battles after battles, he went on top of everyone. So what happened at that time was that Nei also was not in a previous class, but then with his success, she became the first first lady. So that was very remarkable in a sense that someone like no one that we knew of became the first first lady. So Nay's story was very remarkable in a sense of like, you know, just a little bit different from Lady Higashi's time. But she did not assume that she could fight either to protect herself at that time. She knew that writing was something very, very important for this unification process. So the first lady, Nei, what she did was that she stayed in a castle and then tried to use the power of pen once again. So before we take a look at her writing, I would like to invite you to her castle just to see where she lived and then where she was conducting her negotiation. So this is another very small slideshow that tells you where she lived and then what her castle town looked like.
she was probably this person in the kimono, but we can't see her face so that we are not sure that that's actually her. But it is said to be that this figure in the red kimono is Nei. So the first, first lady of Japan. So her letter writing practice started when her husband was still going through the battles. So that Nei was staying in this castle, and then her husband was going into the battlefield. With the distance, they had to communicate. Unification was not just on the battleground, but she had to help him out at the castle. For example, Nei's husband trying to say in the letters, during my absence, please give firm orders to keep everything working. Also, please be careful with fire. So what's happening at that time was that when the unifier was, unifier was away, he was delegating his power to the person, the paired ruler, the first lady, to take in charge of his project. So they become very important thanks to the letters that she exchanged with her husband. And the story gets more and more interesting after this unification started to progress more. And then her husband does not have to be away, now in the castle. And then they, they, they together could rule um, the country. And in the country, it used to be 250 domains, now started to welcome foreigners, for example. So there are more issues to deal with than just this internal conflict at that time. So at the end of the 16th century, again, unifying 250 uh, domains and also welcoming the foreigners or to communicate with the foreigners, the letters becomes very, very important. And then one thing that we didn't know at that point is that the next letter I saw, like many, many letters, like say 30 to 40, they were not actually that interesting. But then those not interesting letters tell me something about the connection between the lady samurai and diplomacy. So to conclude, we'd like to show you the two uninteresting letters that actually tells us something about diplomacy. The first one is this. I am sending gifts for the new year. Please show them around. I wish you great happiness. So this letter doesn't seem so important, isn't it? Doesn't have much information in it, and then it doesn't have anything spectacular. I thought I would be ignoring those things, but then there are bunches of them, like 30. The second one, for example, I receive a white silk for a celebration. I am very happy, and I will be admiring it for a long time. You live very far away, but you never changed. I heard that your son will come to Kyoto in the spring. I'm waiting to see him here. Please take care. Thank you. So it's more like a letter that somebody is coming to see her, but still, again, nothing seems to be very interesting. So this is a key point. The exchange of letters are somehow important, and then there was a reason why Nei had to keep writing even after the unification was completed. So Nei had to send gift at a certain occasion. Nei had to be writing until the end of her life. Why is that? So that was a key point I came back to, uh, as a historian, I came up very uh, interesting in terms of the diplomacy. So what was really happening let, uh, to those letters? Those letters that do not look like important was actually very, very important in cultivating a sense of diplomacy. So let's think, let me talk about why those are the important things here. So writing to someone to keep in touch is a diplomatic gesture. The continuity of conversations was essential to maintaining a good relation with others. As many of you here agree on me this, to me this, on this point, diplomacy is an art, an art of continuing dialogues. So it is a constant effort and it is continuous conversation between the two. And in my opinion, by looking at those letters, that does not seem important. It's actually important in terms of making a sense of diplomacy. So Japan becoming a nation, the samurai fought, but what Lady Samurai contributed really 
is to cultivate the sense of diplomacy. Ney wrote for the stability of the new government. And building firm connection with those who lived in remote places, she helped to prevent unnecessary trouble and aggressions. So Lady Samurai wrote, and we have never seen act of diplomacy, especially by the women in Japanese history before her time. So now what should we get from it? What should we learn from the Lady Samurai? What is the message here? So we live in the 21st century, and we do have nation states already, but even with nations, we still think of forms and effectiveness of governance. Like we gather here today at the summit, we are trying to create a global network that can provide us a long-term stability. We are trying to create a greater network of intelligence and empathy. That is our everyday work. We write to ensure fairness, independence, freedom, and safety of human beings. In that sense, we still share the similar concern with Lady Higashi and Lady Nei. The position that they were at at that time could be very similar to many places that we live right now. The Lady Samurai wrote to negotiate and wrote to avoid instability, and in believing in careful work and on paper, they sent out trust and hope. Are we doing the same now? That is a question, or that is something for us to think about every day. And then that is why I share the stories of the lady samurai who wrote and negotiate, and then trying to tell us what should we be doing here by words and by writing. So, thank you very much. Thank you.